Uh, chapter four. Yeah. Uh, Pastor Mark, we could pray as we look at a few verses here and also in the, in the, in the book about Christmas. And how could anyone miss Christmas even though they did? Lord, we uh, thank you that we can come together this morning to uh, open up your word and hear this message. I pray you, Pastor Kevin, put your spirit and power to preach your word. And give us, Lord, all ears to hear and a heart that we receive everything that, that you have for us today, that you would um, just make yourself known to us and you would just receive and, and uh, be blessed by this message. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 The most important person in the Bible was born in Bethlehem. And many missed it. The Lord spoke of the Messiah's coming all through the Old Testament. And most everyone missed it. How is that possible? Today we can do basically the same thing if we're not careful. We miss the whole point of why Jesus came. Let's not miss it. In Malachi, now we know that the book of Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. In fact, some people believe the book of Malachi is the end of the Bible. The Jews believe, the Orthodox Jews believe that this is the conclusion, this is the, the word of God that God gave to them, and it, and it ends in Malachi. So the last chapter of Malachi, I want to read <coughs> the just six verses, and then also another uh, passage in Malachi. Because this is the last word that they have until the New Testament. This is the last prophetic voice that the nation of Israel is going to have for 400 years. That's a long time. 400 years. Our country not even that old. <coughs> So look at Malachi chapter 4. We'll begin the first one. <coughs> For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them ne neither root nor branch. <coughs> But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. This is a reference to the day of the Lord, which is a judgment time period in the end times. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is not a one, one day. It's a series of days, a time period of judgment in the end time. It speaks about this in the Old Testament a lot, especially with the minor prophets. Then he says this, verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. He says, remember ye the law of Moses. Remember the old covenant remember what God said he wants he wants them this is the last words before 400 years of silence so he wants them to remember what was said on Horeb because that's all they're going to have the law of Moses is going to guide them it's going to be a guide to them throughout these the, the 400 years of of silence they're really not silent because they had the word of God they had the law they also had the prophets before that told them what's going to happen throughout that 400 years. In the book of Daniel chapter 11 goes through and tells, tells them, because right now in a time period going into the intertestamental period, that's the, the 400 years, we would say the intertestamental period between the, the testaments. And when they go into the intertestamental period, you have Babylon as a world power and then it was the Medes and the Persians. Now, they go into the intertestamental period with the Medes and the Persians being a world power. Then after that, it already tells them in the book of Daniel, the world power is going to come into play. After you have Babylon, then you have Medes and Persians, then you're going to have Greece, Alexander the Great. And then after, after Greece with Alexander the Great, you're going to have the Romans. 
So all these world powers, and when Jesus is born, Rome is a world power. So they already knew somewhat of what was going to happen because of the prophecy they are already given. And the law of Moses is going to guide them. Now Moses said, he said that there's going to come a prophet like unto me. And Moses is a type of Christ. There's going to come a prophet like unto me. He says, him ye shall hearken. Listen to him. So already it says, remember what Moses said. Remember the law of Moses. He said that there's going to come a prophet. The law that's supposed to guide them. So what does the law tell them? The law tells them, this is the requirements. You can't keep it. And the law points to a Savior. And they had to do the, the offerings and the sacrifices. And they had to have a priesthood and a tabernacle. They had to have all of this to approach God. In order to get into the presence of God, they had to have a priesthood. They had to have the high priest that went into the Holy of Holies once here in the Day of Atonement. All of this pointed to the coming Messiah. And the Bible says that the law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That we would know. The schoolmaster tells us we can't make it to heaven. We need a savior. So it says that already. Remember ye the law of Moses. Remember the Mosaic covenant. The Mosaic covenant was conditional. The Abrahamic covenant was unconditional. They had to remember these covenants. Verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Before the last day time periods of judgment, the day of the Lord, there's going to come forth Elijah the prophet. Now remember, Jesus said, if you can understand that John the Baptist is the one that came, who was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, he is the one that came in the spirit and power of Elijah. If you can understand this and you can know that, that the forerunner has come and I'm the Messiah. Amen. If you can connect those dots. So there's a definite, more than a, just a hint of what to look for. Behold, I will send you Elijah the, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So you have the forerunner who is going to set the stage. He's going to prepare the way. Like before a king would come, before a royal dignitary, or before you have uh, uh, someone that's prominent coming, you would have the forerunner who would go before. And he would make sure everything is straight. Everything is prepared. You'd clear out all any kind of debris out of the way. And if there was any potholes, they'd fill them in. They'd level out the roads. So they he's preparing the way for the monarch so as he traveled with his entourage and he, he wouldn't um, there wouldn't be any obstacles. So figuratively speaking, that's what John the Baptist is gonna do. He's gonna pave the way for the Messiah. But know this you're not gonna have a Messiah until you have the forerunner. If you don't have a forerunner, then we're under a curse and nothing can be done. Because we're under a curse, but Jesus Christ became a curse for us. And because he did, because John the Baptist came, and then we know that Jesus came, and Jesus hung on a cross for our sins. Curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. He became a curse for us so that the curse could be lifted. We're under a curse from Adam, from, from when Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. We're dead in trespasses and sins, and we're separated from God for all of eternity. But Jesus Christ became the curse for us. So he said, lest I come and, and smite the earth with a curse. This doesn't happen. You're going to be under the curse. And nothing, there's nothing else that can, that can lift the curse other than the Messiah, who is going to come after the forerunner. So all you need to do is look for the forerunner. Now, the forerunner is John the Baptist, and look at chapter, Malachi chapter 3. <coughs> Behold, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the <coughs> covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. Look at the book of, turn back to the book of Isaiah. Look 
at Isaiah 40, verse 1. Isaiah 40, verse 1 says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is parted, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. <coughs> Who is that talking about? Prepare ye the way of the Lord. You see where it says Lord? This is just a um, parenthesis message within a message. But you see where it says Lord, capital all in all capitals? That is Jehovah. <coughs> So, who is the voice of one in the wilderness? John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the voice crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way of who? The Lord. And that's Jehovah, right? Who did John the Baptist prepare the way for? Jesus. Jesus is? Jehovah. You can even use it, uh, Jehovah's Witness Bible, and, and you can come up with that. And you know what else? There's already changed it to Jehovah. It'll say that the voice of one crying in the wilderness prepare ye the way of Jehovah. And you should know too that Jesus Christ is Jehovah. Now if you know in the book of Isaiah, some people would say, Brother Kevin Hart would say this, that it is a miniature Bible. And each chapter corresponds to a chapter to a book in the Bible. So Isaiah 1 would correspond to what? Genesis. <laughs> so um, Isaiah 39 would correspond to what? So chapter 40 would correspond to what? That'd be New Testament, right? So who's going to be the first one in the New Testament that's going to come on the scene before Jesus? Isn't that what it says in verse 3? Isaiah 40. So you see that you got the book of Isaiah, you got the book of Malachi, you know who's going to come next. How do you miss it? How do you miss it? Now they go into the intertestamental period, and you have, of course, you, know, you have the Babylonians, and then in the intertestamental period, you have the Medes and the Persians, you have Greece, you have Rome. And during this time, you also have the Maccabean Revolt. That's when the when you had the Syrian <coughs> leader Antiochus Epiphanes and all the things that had happened. And make a long story short, they uh, overthrew the Syrians, and then there was a Mecca, Maccabean uh, revolt. And then you have the descendants of the Maccabeans. One of the descendants was a person named Asmon, or Asmon. And so you had this dynasty. And so now, when Jesus was born, you had the uh, <coughs> this dynasty of the Maccabeans. You have Herod, who was an Edomite, marry a wife who was related to that prominent group. So she had some notoriety, or she had the bloodline, because he's trying to cater to the Jews, right? So now when Jesus comes on the scene, you had different religious groups that were already in play. You had the Pharisees. This all developed. In fact, the Hasmoneans were the ones that controlled the office of the high priest. It was corrupt already. It wasn't just who God selected, it was who they selected. And there was a lot of power associated with the position of high priest. And you know, like, just like today with politics, there's a lot of corruption, and they had a lot of corruption. You had this, this, the Sadducees that controlled the, the Supreme Court, the, the um, Sanhedrin, they were the ones that were involved with that. You had the Herodians, were, which with, they were just trying to win favor from Herod. You, have the, you had the Zealots, who were uh, like the militia, they were trying to overthrow Rome. They were trying to, uh, they, were, they were like a military group that was trying to overthrow Rome and they were looking for a military leader to lead them. Judas Iscariot was a zealot. Then you had the mountain, uh, no, you had the, the monks, the Essens. They're the ones that, that uh, translated scripture. You had these different religious groups when Jesus comes on the scene. But as they go into the, into the intertestamental period, they already know from Malachi what's next in line. And you know what? They miss it. Why? Because of the hardness of their heart. If we're not careful, we can have hardness of heart too and we can miss the whole thing. But listen how hard it is to miss it. So they already knew who was next in line. You had the forerunner, 
John the Baptist that, that they're supposed to look for. The Bible says that. So now look at um, Luke chapter 1. By the way, Luke actually picks up where Malachi finishes. You have the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew and in Luke. So it says, For as much as ye have taken in hand is set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemeth good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Same person is, is addressed to in the book of Acts. So you have Malachi goes to Luke, and then Luke goes to what? Goes to Acts. Finished, it, it continues on. The Bible is, a, there's a storyline in the Bible, and it is good to understand it in that story. That's why we're doing the overviews, you know, in the afternoon class. That thou mightest know the certain certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abiah, and his wife was, a, was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of the incense. So now here you have, you picking up from Malachi. You already know that God told them to remember what Moses said. Because God made a covenant with his people on Mount Sinai. The people said, all you will say, we will do. Did they do it? No. Could they do it? No. But they had to remember what God told them. For 400 years, He said, remember. So now, it says, there in the days of Herod the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abiah. The priesthood was divided into courses. Now this priest's name is Zacharias. And his name means... God remembers. He told them to remember. They didn't remember. But God remembered. Why? Because God doesn't ever forget. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. So we just went. This is like a continuation. Malachi into Luke. God told them to remember something, something. God, and so for 400 years, God never forgot. They forgot. So now we see in Luke a person, a priest named Zacharias. God remembers. Marries a woman named Elizabeth. Her name means his covenant. Oh. <laughs> and they're going to miraculously have a child named John. <clears throat> you know his name means the grace of God. But see, do you remember what Moses said? All the commands, 613? 613 ordinances boiled down to the Ten Commandments, the moral law. They had the moral law. They had the civil law. They had the dietary law. They had the hygienic law. They had all kind of law. They couldn't keep it. Because the law told them right away in Exodus chapter 20. And they said, we will do it. They didn't do it. They knew they didn't do it. 
they knew they couldn't do it. So God gave them Leviticus. He gave them a priesthood. He gave them the burnt offering. He gave them the trespass offering. He gave them the sin offering. He gave them the meal offering that they're to bring to the to the tabernacle. And the priest, the mediator, would offer these offerings and sacrifices because the people were sinners. And they had to bring a substitute. They had to bring an innocent offering. And every time it's an animal's throat was slit, it was a reminder of their sin. And they were, they were reminded. And as the priest would offer this up to God, and then every year the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies to offer the blood of the, of the goat, of the sacrifice, that sprinkled the blood seven times on the altar, on the mercy seat. So God would look down from heaven on his word that had been violated, like the, like the commandments on Sinai. But you'd see it through the blood of the innocent sacrifice. And they would receive mercy instead of judgment. So God remembered. They didn't remember. You couldn't, you, you could not, you can't make it to heaven. You don't have the righteousness of, you don't have righteousness. <laughs> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For there's none righteous. No, not one. They, they didn't remember. But God remembered His covenant. He says, you don't need. You, you, can't do, you can't keep the law. You need what? The grace of God. Do you remember what God said? Yeah, we remember. Yeah, you need the grace of God. God remembers His covenant. You can't keep it. You need the grace of God. And, here. and this, this is the parents of John the Baptist. How did they miss it? <coughs> so they had the forerunner that was prophesied in Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Malachi 3, 1. Isaiah 40. They had other things. I have to go quick now. They had prophecies. They had prophecies. The Bible is the only book that has prophecies. Oh, there's other books that have prophecies that did happen. <laughs> the religion is done away with them. That he is going to be born of a virgin. <coughs> How often does that happen? <laughs> Isaiah 7, verse 13 through 14. And he said, Hear ye now, O house of David, is it a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore... The Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. That ought to be a dead giveaway. That was a prophecy. The time of his birth. So they knew from the prophecies that Jesus Christ was going to be born of a virgin. That ought to set off a lot of alarms in your mind of that. This is something special. Then the time of his birth. They knew the time of his birth. From Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Verse 25 of that of Daniel 9 refers to a specific time for the coming of Messiah. The seven weeks and the, and the 62 weeks combined to make 69 weeks, it, it comes out to 483 years under the coming of the Messiah. <coughs> the starting point for the 483 years was the, de the, was the decree to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. This is a reference to the decree given in the time of Nehemiah in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes in 445 BC. That's Nehemiah chapter 2. Being that Israel uses 360 day year, that's a prophetic year by the way, the days would come out to be, if you did the math, 173,880 days from 450, 445 B.C. is going to be 173,880 days, and the Messiah would appear on the scene. They knew the time frame. The words, until Messiah the Prince, from Daniel chapter 9, refer to a time when Messiah would be manifested as the Prince of Israel. This is a reference to when he rode into Jerusalem on the, on, on the back of a donkey, of a colt, on what we call Palm Sunday, or what we call the triumphal entry. This is when Jesus presented himself and was recognized by the people as the Messiah, or those that 
cried out, Hosanna, which is save us, which is a song, uh, part of the Psalms of Ascent that they were required to sing during the feast days. They're singing about all this truth. Here comes the Messiah, and they miss it, and they think that they're gonna that he has come to lead them in a military a coup against Rome. So Jesus, he knows their hearts, and he weeps over Jerusalem. So he goes into the temple. Remember when the glory was in the temple in Ezekiel's day, and it left? The glory departed? Boy, it has returned. Jesus is on, I mean, here you have the Messiah, His presence tabernacled in the body of Jesus, has entered into the temple. And what happened since the last time? Nothing. It's the same. When the glory departed in Ezekiel, and God showed Ezekiel in a vision, or He took him there, however He transported him, and he could see inside the, he looked all throughout the land and see the high places, see all the, the, the false ways of worship. And then he also shows him an image uh, in front of the temple. He shows him the women that are, that are weeping for Tammuz, the uh, satanic uh, uh, religion from Babylon, from Nimrod. A false religious system, pagan religion, and they're weeping for Tammuz. And the men are worshiping the sun god. And there's images of four-footed beasts and creepy things on the walls of the, of the temple. And he shows him that. And so he shows him into the holy place. And he sees, you see the, the glory of God on the mercy seat. And it, it comes up off of the mercy seat. And it and comes out through the, the holy of holies. Comes out of the holy place. It comes out of the, of, of the temple. And, and it comes off of the altar. It comes out of the temple. And it leads through the eastern gate. And it leaves the nation. The glory has departed in Ezekiel. Read Ezekiel. talks about the glory has departed. Didn't they rebuild the temple? doesn't come into that temple. Remember the temple was smaller? And then um, the older people were, were crying because they remembered how glorious Solomon's temple was compared to this one. And they cried. And then the, the younger people were excited and they were rejoicing because the temple was built. And, and um, the prophet said, this temple, smaller and everything, but it's, it might not be as glamorous as Solomon's, but it is more glorious. But yet the temple didn't, the glory didn't fill that temple until the triumphal entry. And Jesus goes into the temple with his disciples and he looks around. And everyone's looking at him and he's looking at them. Well, I imagine they're looking at him. I'm sure he caused a disturbance. Does Jesus cause a disturbance? Man, I got everything going on. Now I got to go to church. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, I'm gonna come there leave early. As much little bit as a disturbance as possible. Because this is disturbing me. You feel like that? Whoa. No, that's other church people. Yeah. No, <laughs> After the service, man, that's a big disturbance. <laughs> <laughs> like football teams to cheer for. Whoa! <laughs> Just Jesus can really disturb me. So inconvenient. He looks in the temple. You're looking at him. He looks at them. He looks at his disciples, and they looked at him. Maybe they don't like this dip. And then he went out. He left. You know what he was thinking? Probably. How much has changed? How much has changed? They might not be openly worshiping idols, just like us. They might not openly worship, but yet they had other things before him. And their heart was hardened, and they didn't recognize it. And so he left. And then guess what? It wasn't long after that. If that was on Sunday or Monday, it wasn't just a few days later that they crucified him. The same ones that cried out, Hosanna, save us now. From the Romans. Cried out, crucify That's not, he's not what we expect. He became a Christian, those things not what you expect. God promised to save your soul from a lake of fire. He promised to save us from sin, death, and hell. And he will do that. It does not mean you're not going to have physical problems, financial problems, relationship problems, or all kind of problems because we live in a cursed world, although the curse has been lifted from off of the heart of the nation. So he leaves. The words Messiah the Prince refer to the time when Messiah would be manifested as the Prince of Israel. And if you go 173,880 days from the date 445 BC, you come up to April 6, 32 AD. That's the exact date that 
the triumphal entry took place. God gave him the exact day he was going to be on the scene. He presented himself as king. They should have known the time frame. They should have known the virgin birth. The Bible tells the place of his birth. We know this because the priests, they told, they knew that the, the chief priests knew, right? They knew the exact place. They knew what the prophet said to tell Herod. Ma Micah 5, verse 2 and 3. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Therefore I give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, then the remnant of the brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. It's a well-known prophecy about the place. So born of a virgin, time of his birth, place of his birth, and many other prophecies, just quickly, that he was going to be a male child, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, Isaiah 9, 6. He's going to be a child born in the line of Shem, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, and Solomon. He is going to be a physical descendant of David and a legal heir to the throne through Solomon, yet not a physical descendant through Jeconiah. That can be complicated. We'll explain that later. A child born of a virgin, Matthew 1, Luke 1. A descendant of David, son of Jesse, but not until the 10th generation after Perez. Born around 4 AD in accordance with the prophecy of Daniel 9, 24. One would, who would be preceded by a forerunner, born in Bethlehem. Born of circumstances that would identify him as the Savior and the Star of David, the long-awaited Messiah. Other prophecies, he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey's coat. We, we looked look at that. He would be betrayed by a friend. The betrayal would be for 30 pieces of silver. The money would be used to, or the price of a slave. The money would be used to purchase the potter's field, Zechariah 11, 13. The Messiah would die a sacrificial death for us. Isaiah 53, 8, Daniel 9, 26, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He would die with criminals, but his burial would, would be with the wealthy. How's that? He's going to die with criminals, but his burial is going to be with the wealthy. We see that happen. Criminals died between the two thieves, yet he was buried in the tomb of, Aram, of Joseph of Arimathea. He would rise from the dead. He would say certain words on the cross. He would be mocked, and people would gamble for his clothes. Psalms 22, <coughs> verse 1, 8 and 18. According to the biblical requirement that a prophecy must have a 100% rate of accuracy that the true Messiah of Israel must fulfill. He must fulfill them all, or else he is not the Messiah. And the chances of these prophecies by a professor, professor of mathematics, in which he's really good at math, the probability is 1 in 10 to the 21st power. That's a lot of zeros. 21 zeros. How many zeros does the billion have? 9? 6? 9? Nine. Trillion has what? What? 12. 12 genes? <laughs> What's after a trillion? Chapter trillion. Gazillion? Centillion? How about 10 with 21 zeros? That's the chance of how many prophecies? Only 8. And there's a lot more than eight. Just eight. Otherwise, the numbers would just get too, too big. Prophecies is one of the best evidences of the truth of the Bible. In fact, God says that I know the end from the beginning. These other so-called gods do not. He challenges them in Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 44. He challenges them. You, you think you're something? Well, what's, you tell the end from the beginning. You cannot. Only God can do that. You know what? He's already there. So you had the prophecies. You also had the star. We'll go into more detail later about this. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheph. You have the prophecies. You have the star. You have the forerunner. And what? 
they missed it. They missed it. Most of them missed it. Not all, but most of them missed it. <coughs> Why? Some people did not know. Some people did not care. Now they could have known. They should have known. They didn't care. Some people were too busy or too distracted. Some people just did not believe. Just think of the chief priest. They knew, but they didn't care. I mean, they didn't even go. It was from the distance from here to Windward Mall. And yet you had the wise men that came from hundreds of miles. They came from Mesopotamia, probably that area. That far of a distance, five to seven hundred miles. And these guys wouldn't even go five miles. It's not how far you got to travel. It's if you care or not. If you believe or not. <laughs> what can we do so we don't miss it? Now, we we have, that have received Jesus Christ have received Him as our Savior. But if we're not careful, we can drift from Him. And that biggest time or the time that we can drift the most could be around this time. We celebrate Christmas one. So what do we do? A couple of things. Are number one, rest in Jesus. Don't get too busy. This time of year you can get really busy. Don't get too busy. Rest in Jesus. Just relax. Enjoy Jesus. Rest in Him. He says, Come unto me, all you that are la la that all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. Learn of me. And you shall find rest for your souls. You don't want to miss the point of Jesus' birth. Rest in Jesus. Then the next thing, worship. Make church and devotions a priority. Make it a priority. Make your Bible reading and your prayer your priority. Make Worship corporately in the church a priority. Make uh, church functions a priority. Can't come to everything, I understand that. The Christmas party, Christmas caroling, things like that. As much as you can, make it a priority so you can, because you be a part of it. It's about relationships with Jesus and with each other. Make it a priority, <coughs> get involved, be a part of it. Find a way to, to get involved. Tell others. Use this opportunity to tell others of Jesus Christ and why He came. Use this opportunity. It's a great opportunity. Some people get so wrapped up in well, I don't think Jesus was born on December 25th. I don't either. <laughs> but so what? Make this this is a great opportunity to share the love of Jesus. Use this as an opportunity to tell others. Use this as, as an opportunity when you give someone a gift to tell <coughs> people about the greatest gift that was ever given. Last thing, give to others. That's what Christmas is all about. And God came down to give His life. He was born to die. Use this op opportunity to give to others. Find some people that are needy. Be a blessing to them. Find someone, get some of our resources together instead of using it for ourselves. And even for those who are closest to us, because that's really natural, and, 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 I, and I think we ought to do that. Be a blessing. Buy, you know, make Christmas a joyous occasion. Don't be a Scrooge. <laughs> I played that part. I played that part. Don't be, boy, the, the commercial aspect of Christmas driving me crazy, so I'm going to just be not, I'm going to be very unjoyful. Well, that's even worse. At least other people have, at least they're excited about something. Be joyful. Use it, a, use it, make, make it a great event for your children. But, give to someone that's needy. Give to someone that's needy. What do you give? Give your time. You know, such a blessing to hear, you know, like when people from our church do certain things. <laughs> like going to a nursing home to sing songs it'll be a blessing I guarantee you when we do that kind of stuff we feel more joyful 
than almost anything else that we do around this place. Is when you are blessing to somebody with your time, with your talent, you know, with your singing, with your whatever kind of talent that you have, whether it's cleaning up people like at the Christmas party, the setting up and then the cleaning up. You know, they're all blessings. Whether you made food or whether you packed it up. Whatever, whatever part of involvement, finding someone who has a need, someone that maybe no one is really noticing much, do something for that person. Give to others. Give to those that are in need and enjoy the gift of giving. Not the obligation of giving. This can also be a problem. And you know what? You want to get something for somebody? Just get it. Don't worry about all the people you didn't get. They're going to be mad. Just, yeah. just be a blessing and be blessed. That's what's all about. That God came, that Jesus Christ came down to this earth to give up Himself for us. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Don't miss Christmas. Don't miss it. They missed it. We don't gotta miss it. Don't miss it. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no looking around. Do you know for sure if you're to die right now that you'd be in heaven with Jesus for all of eternity? If you know that for sure, would you raise your hands and test?